Well, good morning, church. Uh, my name's David Pfizer. Uh, I'm a pastor here at The Well. Uh, thank you for tuning in to our live stream this morning. Uh, we are in uh, the passage of Isaiah today. And before we begin, uh, could we start with a word of prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today uh, thankful, thankful that you've given us another Sunday to sing to you, to hear your word being read, to hear your word being taught, uh, thankful that we can gather together uh, virtually with the saints. And God, we pray that this would not be just another Sunday. We pray, Lord, that you would do what only you can do, that you would make a way when there is no way, that you would do what is impossible, Lord, that you would melt our hearts, that you would transform our hearts to shape us and to mold us to be more like Christ. God, I pray that the words that come out of my mouth, that they would be honoring and glorifying to you. Would you be with me? Would you speak through me? And that which is of not, uh, that is not of you, Lord, would we easily dismiss but that, what is true, Lord, what is it, your word, would it build us and shape us to be more like Christ? And it's in his name that we pray, amen. Well, church, I'm sure all y'all know who Freddie Mercury is, right? The great lead singer of Queen. And one of his songs that I love to ride my bike to that always pumps me up is the song, I Want It All. All right, uh, and the chorus, it's not very poetic, it's very simple, and it goes like this. He says, I want it all, I want it all, I want it all, and I want it now. <laughs> and that's what he sings, that's the chorus. I want it all, I want it all, and I want it now. And when I hear those words, I think we can all relate with that, right? We, we want it all. And we want it now. We are the Amazon Prime generation. When we order something, we expect it to get there to our house in two days. And maybe a couple years from now, we might be the Amazon Now generation, where we expect it to get to our door immediately, right? We hate waiting. We hate waiting for things. We hate being in traffic. We hate waiting for um, problems in our house to get fixed. We hate problems in our relationships. Like anytime there's a problem, we want it to be fixed and we want it to be fixed immediately. We want it all and we want it now. But that's an illusion, isn't it? That's an illusion to believe that we can have it all and we can have it now. I think that's a lie that we believe because we don't want to wait for things. I was reminded of that when I first moved to D.C. Three years ago, my wife and I moved out here because my wife got a dream opportunity uh, at a Christian justice organization. And so when I moved out here, I left my job not knowing what was next, but I had dreams, I had plans, I had ambitions. I wanted to plant a church, I wanted to do ministry in a poor neighborhood, I wanted to do amazing justice work, and that's what I was looking for. And I remember I was interviewing at another church uh, that wasn't the well before I came across uh, Matt Klingler and uh, met with this pastor who was a great guy. Turned out, you know, I didn't feel like I was a great fit for that church, but he was a great man of God. And I remember telling him my dream, like, this is what I want to do. And I remember him telling me, he said, David, <laughs> it just sounds like you're just looking for someone to bring you that silver platter. You're just looking for that dream opportunity now. And he said, I just want to tell you something. I have started and been ministering at my church for over 15 years. And I feel like just now, 15 years into it, I'm starting to see my church be the church I've wanted it to be. He's like, I've had to wait 15 years. I was like, well, you might have to wait 16 because I'm not going to take the job you're offering me, you know. But, <laughs> but I'll never forget what he said. And it was sobering because it's like, hey, 
I want the silver platter. I want it all. I want it now. But I, I think God, what he's been teaching me in this season, like, you got to wait for it. You got to wait. And in the season of, of COVID that we're in, we're used to having it all. We're used to having it now. We're, we're not used to being told no. Not, you know, we're not used to not being able to gather. We're, we're used to having it all. We're used to having it now. But now, there's not much we can do. We're just stuck waiting. We're waiting on a vaccine. We're waiting on an election. We're waiting on justice to come in our country. Personally, we're, we're waiting for a breakthrough. We're waiting for freedoms from addictions. We're waiting on our marriage to get better. We're waiting on our, on our kids to change. We're waiting on a miracle. And there's nothing that we can do. There's, no, there's, no, like there's no more books that we can read or research that we can do or, or things that can be said. We just simply have to wait. And so for these next three weeks, what we wanted to do was just slow down and just do a mini-series on waiting. What does God have to say to us about waiting? You know, when you study the Old Testament, I think I read this week that over 60 times you will find the phrase in the Old Testament, wait on the Lord. And so, what do we need to know about waiting? What I want to talk to you about today is, is to encourage you, is to remind you, and is to challenge you. What we're going to learn about today is that we have a God who works for those who wait on him. And what we're going to see in this passage, we read Isaiah 64, we read all 12 verses, but we're just really going to focus on verse 4, where Isaiah says, we have a God who acts for those who wait on him. And so we're going to see three things. First off, we're going to see, we have number one, we have a God uh, who is unique. Our God is unique. Secondly, we're going to see we have a God who works. And then third, we're going to see how we are to wait on him. So we're going to see the uniqueness of God. We're going to see the work of God. And then we're going to see how to wait on him. So if you have your Bibles, let's get into this. Uh, Isaiah, 60, uh, Isaiah 64, verse 4. Now, before we get into that, let me just give you a little context. In Isaiah, Isaiah is a prophet of the northern kingdom of Israel. And Isaiah has, uh, Isaiah has tons of great themes about the coming of Messiah. But in chapter 64, Isaiah is lamenting, he is grieving, and he is crying out to God because his nation has been sacked, it has been destroyed, it has been taken over by the Babylonian Empire. And if you look at verses 10 and 11, uh, Isaiah cries out, he says, Our holy and beautiful house where our fathers praised you has been burned by fire, and all of our pleasant places have become ruins. Right? Will you restrain yourself at these things, O Lord? He says, you know, in verse 10, he says, Your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem is a desolation. Right? Jerusalem, the capital of his country, is sacked, it's destroyed. I mean, could you imagine that for a second? Being in D.C. and the White House is burned to the ground. The Lincoln Memorial is, is turned into rubble. The acorn in downtown Silver Spring, if you know where that's at, it's been defaced, right? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine living in, your, in the capital of your country and it's just rubble? I mean, what could you do? What could you do if you're in that situation? There's not, I mean, what can Isaiah do? His country's been taken over. He can't raise up another revolution. All his friends have either been captured or killed. He can't fight against the Babylonians. He's one person. His hands are tied. He's, he, maybe he's in captivity. Like, who knows? There's, there's nothing he can do but just, but just pray. And so this, in Isaiah 64, it's just this prayer, a cry for justice. And as he's crying, though, Isaiah, what most commentators say, what the kind of the apex or the climax 
of this passage is in verse 4, and Isaiah reminds himself and he reminds his people of the uniqueness of God. And he says in verse 4, from of old, no one has heard or perceived by ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. He says, our God is unique. No eye has seen about this God. No ear has heard about this God. No one has perceived about this God. There is no God like our God. And if you read Isaiah, Isaiah all throughout this book will say again and again and again, there is no other God but Yahweh. There is no one like the Lord In the midst of the chaos and the uncertainty being under captivity, Isaiah reflects and meditates on the uniqueness of his God. Now, how does his God, our God, how is he unique? In Isaiah, Isaiah is always comparing and contrasting Yahweh, his God, with the Babylonian gods. And so... He does this in Isaiah 46, verses 1 through 4, which should be on the screen. And I want to read to you what Isaiah says about the Babylonian gods and how he compares them to his God. So on the screen, just read along. He says, Bel, that's a Babylonian god. Bel bows bows down. Nebo, another Babylonian god, stoops Their idols are on beasts and livestock. These things, listen, you carry are born as burdens on weary beasts. They stoop, they bow down together. They cannot save the burden, but themselves go into captivity. Verse 3 says, listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel who have been born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb, even to your old age I am he, and to gray hairs I will carry you. I have made, and I will bear, I will carry, and I will save. What is Isaiah saying is the difference between the Babylonian gods and his God? He says, the Babylonian gods, you have to carry them. He says, these idols, these these idols that you worship, you carry them. They are a weight to you. They are a burden to you. You carry them. In Babylonia, like when they would sack, when they would sack a, a different, you know, country or empire, what they would do is they would take all their money, then they would take their gods and they would carry their gods on on carts back to, to Babylon. When I was in India uh, about a year ago, we were just you know, India is, is a whole different place, right? And for as many churches there are in our communities here, there is many different just temples of different gods. And one night we were hanging out in Mumbai and we just hear this crowd hooting and hollering and dancing and singing. And it's just this parade of people following this truck. And on the bed of the truck is the God that they were worshiping but they had to carry their God that they worshipped. Now, you might say, well, David, you know, what the Babylonians did, even whatever happens in India, that's primitive, right? We're we're Western civilization. We we know better. We we don't kind of buy into those idols. But I want to tell you, church, Martin Luther says this. He says, every heart is an idol factory. Everyone worships. You cannot escape worship. Everyone has something or someone that you worship, right? To worship an idol, to worship is like what you give primary importance of. And every single one of us in here, whether you're a Christian, you're not a Christian, whether you believe in God, you're an atheist, we all worship something. And in the DMV, maybe we don't make statues, (laughs) but we worship power, don't we? We worship power. We worship our careers. We worship our families. 
Some of us, we worship our kids. In the Christian faith, we, we might not worship Jesus. We might worship just a religion, our, our piety. Maybe some of us, we worship social justice. But the question I want to ask you is this. Whatever you are worshiping, science, reason, power, fame, beauty, comfort, a person, even yourself, whatever you are worshiping, is it carrying you or are you carrying it? Think about that. Is it carrying you or are you carrying it? Isaiah says, whatever God you worship outside of Yahweh, you will always end up having to carry. If you worship your job, your job, sure, it gives you benefits, but you have to keep working, keep laboring to keep getting paid, right? If you worship beauty, sure, beauty gives you certain benefits, but you have to keep exercising, keep staying up on the trends to stay beautiful, if you worship your kids, sure, your kids give you joy, but you have to continue reading, continue laboring, continue to make sure you're not making the mistakes so that your kid turns out to be the kid you want them to be. If you're religious, you think, okay, like, yeah, God loves me, does these benefits, but I have to keep obeying, I have to keep doing these things, and you just feel like it's, it's a labor, and what you're doing is you're doing the caring. But Isaiah, in the midst of this chaos, in the midst of the certainty, he remembers the uniqueness of his God and put this, put this slide back on. And he says, other gods we have to carry, but our God carries us. Our God carries us. Verse 4, God says, I have made, I will bear, I will carry, and I will save. In the midst of your waiting, remember you have a God who will carry you. John Piper, who's really influenced this entire sermon that I'm giving, he gives us a now, this story of he, used, he would run in his neighborhood and he would always run by the store. It would have a help wanted sign. And then one day he's running by it and he sees that sign and, and the sign says, no help wanted. And Piper says, in the only way that Piper can, he's like, that's the gospel. God does not need our help. If God needed our help, we would be worshiping you. If God needed Matt Klingler, we would be worshiping Klingler. If God needed David Pfizer, we'd be worshiping David Pfizer. God does not need our help. God's sign on his business says, no help wanted. And then when you're running by, you know what God does? He leaves that shop, and then he runs after you and says, I don't need your help, but I want to help you. <laughs> I'll pick you up. I'll carry you. I'll, I'll carry you and run across with you to the finish line. That's the gospel. Jesus says in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, he says, I did not come to be served but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. I did not come to be carried, I carry. God carries us. He carries us in our waiting. That's the gospel. We don't carry our God. That's what makes our God unique is he doesn't say, you come up to me. He says, I come down to you. And I don't just come down to you and walk with you. You are flat-faced on the ground, and I will pull you up, put you on my shoulders, and carry you across to the finish line. That's the gospel. And so Isaiah, in the midst of his waiting... He remembers the uniqueness of his God. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no one has perceived a God like him who carries us when other gods make us carry them. So Isaiah says there's a uniqueness to God. He's unique in his work, but how does God work? How does God work? Chapter 64, verse 4, he says, uh, God, there's no other God besides you who acts for those who wait on him. 
how does God work? How does he act? In the midst of our waiting, we, we don't really think God is working, do we? We kind of think things are frozen, and yet throughout Scripture, we see season after season, generation after generation, book after book, filled with stories and acts of God's works. How does God work? Think about creation. Who gave you the ability to see? Did you do that? <laughs> Who gave you the ability to hear, to listen, to speak, to taste, to touch, to feel? Did you do that? Did you create that? Who put the sun in its place, in the perfect place? Like if it was a little farther, if it was a little closer to the earth, we would not be here. Who put the sun in the perfect place? Who has surrounded this earth with the air that we breathe? Who has put waters and oceans and rivers that sustain us? Who did that? God did. The saddest thing is, man, we all go to enjoy creation. We will go to the beach to enjoy creation. We will go to the mountains to enjoy creation, but we will never acknowledge the creator, the person who actually made those things possible for us to enjoy. God works in creation. God works in the unseen. <laughs> A story I've been thinking about recently is the story of Esther. And in Esther, she's just this regular Jewish gal under, uh, under the empire. I, it might be the Babylonian empire, some empire. Uh, forgive me for not having that specific detail. But she goes, she's invited to this banquet, and she basically does this kind of beauty pageant. This is like the David Pfizer version of the story. And, uh, and she wins, and she's made queen. And she's made queen. And then all of a sudden, she learns that her king makes a decree to kill all the Jews living in their land, right? And the famous line in Esther is, like, her friend is saying, hey, maybe Esther, maybe you were placed here for such a time as this. And Esther says, I'm going to go to the king and petition the king to save my people, and if I perish, I perish, right? And long story short, she saves uh, the people from, from this imminent, like, defeat, and you know what the crazy thing about Esther is? God is not mentioned once in that book. You will not find God's name anywhere in that book, and it's in the Bible. And but, but what does that teach us? And yet you don't see his name, but you see his fingerprints are everywhere, creating all these coincidences. God works behind the scenes. God works in the impossible. I came across a blog article yesterday that talked about all the impossible situations in Scripture. Right? Let me just read to you a few of the impossible situations of how God works where it seems like, man, these people, this is not a good outcome, and then God just shows up and does the impossible. Like Noah, right? He builds a boat. It's never rained. People are thinking, you're an idiot. You've wasted your whole life, and you're just waiting on these animals to come. But then the impossible happens, and it rains, and animals come, and Noah is rescued. The story of Joseph, and he's sold into slavery by his brothers, and the most likely outcome is he will die a slave. And yet God does the impossible, and he brings him to be second command of all of Egypt. We see the story of Gideon. And judges, and Gideon has this army, and he reduces his army of 32,000 men to 300 to face this other huge army. And the most likely outcome is, is like, all right, Gideon's going to be demolished. But you know what God does? God has those 300 men watch as their enemies kill each other. David and Goliath, David faces this giant, likely outcome. David's going to be crushed. He's going to be a little pawn you just flick off. 
But what does God do? God does the impossible and uses a shepherd boy with just a sling to take down the giant. In Daniel, you see Daniel be thrown into the lion's den. What's the most likely outcome? This guy is going to be a snack for lions. What does God do? The impossible and closes the mouths of lions. We have a God who does the impossible. Isaiah says, no one has seen, no one has heard how God is so unique and how he works, how he creates, how he does the impossible, and even how he works in darkness. And I think that's one of the challenges as we wait because there's, some of us are experiencing real suffering, loss of a job, our health is deteriorating, our families are crumbling. In our nation, we've seen over, we're getting close to 200,000 deaths, right? I mean, there's just darkness and darkness, and it's easy just to be like, God, where are you in the darkness? But we know where God is in the darkness, because the worst thing that ever happened to humanity was on one Friday, we killed the Son of God. And imagine you being there thinking, oh my gosh, we are crucifying, we're killing God, and the thoughts and the feelings you would have on that Saturday. God, where are you? There's just darkness. You've abandoned us. You've, you've, You've destroyed, you've killed, you've taken away our Savior. What was God doing on that Saturday, though? God was working on that Saturday to get us to Sunday. And if God could resurrect and redeem the worst thing possible, the utmost darkness in humanity ever, how could God be resurrecting and redeeming the darkness that we're experiencing right now? In our waiting, we have a God who works for us. My wife and I were reminded of that um, a week ago. We went to the Klingler's. Uh, if you don't know this, the Klinglers have six kids, and we, uh, my wife hadn't seen the Klingler kids for, gosh, five, six months, right? We've all been in quarantine. And so we go to their backyard, and she hadn't seen the kids in five, six months, and she sees them, and they're like, oh my gosh, these kids have grown. These kids have changed. And she just said to our group that night, she said, you know, it's, it's crazy in a world where you feel like our world has stood still, our world has frozen, that there's still growth happening. Kids are still growing up. The sun is still rising. God is still moving. God's still moving in our youth group. We have a small youth group, 10, 12 kids. We've been doing it mostly on Zoom, and we just started having a couple backyard hangouts. And you know what's happening? Our youth group kids are inviting their friends, and their friends are coming from homes that you would never, you would think they would never let their kid go to a church, right? They, like, these are, like, you would never imagine a family would let their kids go to, like, a church, but they're letting their kids go to our backyard hangouts, and they're hearing the gospel for the first time, working through sixth graders. God's still working. And God's not just working in Silver Spring. I want to remind you and encourage you, God is still working globally. And um, oh, I'll just tell you this. I don't know if the slide came up. Is it up? Okay. Oh, here we go. Uh, God is still working globally. I want to share with you the story of Iran. There was a missionary named Robert Bruce who was a 19th century missionary in Iran. And this is what he said about his time there. Let me read this to you. He says he had no fruit. There were like no conversions, right? He says, I'm not reaping the harvest. I scarcely claim to be sowing the seed. I'm hardly plowing the soil, but I'm gathering out the stones. That, too, is missionary work. Let it be supported by loving sympathy and fervent prayer. Right? He says, I'm not even planting seeds. I'm removing stones. Check this out. Now, Iran today, 
in 1979, this is according to some mission sites, uh, organizations, 1979, there were like 500 Christians in Iran. Today, what some organizations say, there are over a half a million Christians in Iran. That's insane. God is working. God is working. Our mission partners in India, pastors in rural villages, just did a baptism. And in India right now, there are anti-conversion laws. And if a pastor is seen baptizing someone, they will be beaten and thrown into jail. If someone is seen or they learn that they are baptized, a new convert, often they share the same fate as the pastor. There is persecution and suffering, and yet our mission partner, Pastor Joseph Sharon, says, man, we just keep baptizing people in these rural villages. Praise God. We have a God who works for those who wait on him. And so that leads us to our last question then, is, well, how do we wait? How do we wait? <laughs> what does it look like to wait? Uh, <clears throat> waiting, uh, as Piper says, waiting often means to consult the Lord first. So in Isaiah, to not to wait typically meant for Jewish people to run to Egypt. So in Isaiah, I think 30, Isaiah is kind of condemning the Jewish people for always running to Egypt because Egypt is where the power was, it's where the wealth was, it's where the resources were. So when the going got tough, these Jewish people were like, well, we just got to go to Egypt. And they would never consult the Lord. And so to wait on the Lord, what it means first is to consult Him. I, this is very simple, right? This is like Christianity 101, just to, but just to pray, and, our, and so the question I have is like, hey, in your waiting, are you praying? Isaiah 64, he hates the circumstances that are happening to him. So what does he do? He cries out to the Lord, are you praying? And I know there's a lot of kind of critique of the idea of like the thoughts and prayers, right? Like, oh, like all these bad things are happening and, and we give these kind of cliche responses of thoughts and prayers. But church, I want you to know prayer might be the most powerful form of protest because you are petitioning the most powerful being in all of creation, the most high God. In your waiting, pray. Eugene Peterson has a great book on this. If you want to do a deep dive on waiting, there's a great book called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction by Eugene Peterson. And he noticed as a pastor his focus would be primarily, he would say, I just focused on Scripture and prayer, Scripture and prayer, Scripture and prayer. And he says, this turned out to be slow work. But then he would get tempted, and this is what he would say, from time to time, impatient with the slowness, I would try out ways of going about my work that promised quicker results. But after a while, it always seemed to be more like meddling in these people's lives than helping them attend to God. I love that, meddling in people's lives. Then he says, more often than not, I found myself getting in the way of what the Holy Spirit had been doing long before I arrived on the scene. And so I would go back, feeling a bit chastised to my proper works, Scripture and prayer, prayer and Scripture. To wait on the Lord what it first means is this, is, is pray, is pray. Seek the Lord. You don't have a job. God, I need a job. Your marriage is falling apart. God, my marriage is falling apart. You feel like you're stuck in a rut. God, I'm in a rut. You feel like you're depressed. God, I'm depressed. You're sick. God, I'm sick. I need healing. You're confused. God, I don't know what to do. You're overwhelmed with the state of our country? God, would, God, our country's insane. This is, there's so much pain. There's so much darkness. Lord, come, Lord Jesus. Just seek his face. And after you pray, you are then faced with basically two options. 
after waiting comes first with prayer, and then you basically have two options, to stand still or to obey him. And so the first is just to stand still. To wait sometimes means to stand still. In Exodus, during the Exodus, uh, when God rescued his people from Pharaoh, God said to his people, he said, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And sometimes when we're waiting on the Lord, we've knocked on every door, we've applied to every job, we've consulted with every doctor, we've read every book, we've had every conversation we could pleading a loved one to change, right? And still nothing's happened, and so our only option then is just to stand still and say, God, I'm at my wit's end here, but you got to provide. But church, I want you to remember God can provide because he works for those who wait on him. And I was reminded of that of suddenly just a quick story. We just rented out our basement to a missionary who's working up. Called, it's Justice House of Prayer, and basically they're just like praying for the capital nonstop. And she was looking for a place that was furnished, but I guess she came across our place was like, hey, this is, I want to live here. So she lived here, and, uh, but she didn't have a bed. And so she was like, I'm going to go to Ikea and just buy a bed. And one of her friends came to her and said this, said, hey, I'm going to give you my truck to rent, I'm going to lend you my truck to pick up a bed. And she's like, oh, well, I have to take it to Ikea. He's like, no, 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 no. Someone's going to provide for you a bed. So just be ready. Literally, the next, that was Friday night, Saturday morning, on our Slack prayer channel for the Well Church, right, on our prayer channel, our prayer team leader, Joyce, messaged the staff and says, hey, my friend is giving away a brand new bed, <laughs> Does anyone need a bed? And I was like, I know someone that does. And, and listen, that's one story, right? And all of you who are listening, who are skeptical, you can think of like, man, I've had plenty of those stories where God never provided a bed. And you're like, there's always times where God provides and there's other times where God doesn't provide. And so because we, we don't want to be super charismatic or super spiritual or weird like that, we kind of reason our way out of God doing miraculous works. And while that's true, God doesn't always provide the things we think we need or want, I do want to tell you this. All throughout Scripture, God does the impossible. Believe who He says He is. If you need a bed... And God puts on your heart that you need a bed. You know what? I bet you God loves to give good gifts. I bet you he's going to give you a bed somehow, some way. And my, my fear is, is that people like us, we love to reason. We love theology. We love systems. But we're afraid to just step out of the boat and to be still and let God provide. But I've seen it time and time again in my story and many other stories. If you stand still, God will fight for you. Wait on the Lord. And then, of course, it's not waiting doesn't just mean praying or standing still, but waiting, waiting also means obeying. So right now I'm preaching a sermon and I'm obeying what I think God has called me to do, which is teach the word of God to you. And as I'm obeying, I'm waiting and hoping that somewhere, some, some person, God will use this and touch their heart and say, surrender your life to Christ. Get rid of your idols and follow him. And that's just, I'm waiting for God to do that as I'm obeying him. And some of you are stuck in a marriage where it's, it's just spiraled out of control, Right? And the only thing you can do, no matter how much your spouse hates you or despises you or has a cold heart against you, all you can do is just serve him and her to sacrifice for him or her over and over again. And as you sacrifice, as you serve, you say, all right, God, warm, warm this person's heart, right? That we just, we stay at our post and we're just being faithful, that's what it means to wait on the Lord until there's a breakthrough. And so continue to obey. Don't give up. <laughs> Don't give up. Obey the Lord. 
because we have a God who works for those who wait on him. Church, we, we want it all, and we want it now. But we're in a season of waiting. And for the Christian, though, we do have a hope that one day we will have it all. And one day we will have it now. <laughs> one day our king is going to return. Injustices will be wiped away. No more sickness, no more disease, no more tears. And we will live in a land that we've always were meant to live in where our God rules and our God reigns. But churches, as we close, I just, I want to encourage you. We are busy people. We value the work of our hands. And in this season, we're like, man, I, I wish I could do this. I wish I could do this. Why can't I do this? I want to do, I want to do, I want to do. But would you just take a step back and remind yourself what Isaiah reminded himself. We have a God who works for those who wait on him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, God, there's no one like you. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no one has perceived a God like you. We do not carry you, you carry us. We did not create this, the creations here, Lord, the earth, the mountains, the moon, the stars. You created that. You created all things. God, you work in the unseen, in the ordinary, in the mundane. You work through the impossible. You work in the midst of the darkness. And God... <laughs> And you're working right now. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to wait upon you. Help us to seek your face. Help us not to run down to Egypt, not to run to our vices, not to run to our security blankets, to our comforts. Help us to run to you. God, fight for us while we stand still. And give us the strength, Lord, to continue to obey in the places where you've called us to obey. Lord, we need you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.